never. And so they had to quickly get the, the AV guys to come in and hook me up because the computer was down there as well. And so while they were hooking me up, his say goodbye to all his people, and my people started to come in. And we now have an overload because we've now got 250 people in the, in the, in the room. And it's only meant to be 234, and the fire wardens have been called to get people away. And now there's a bit of a ruckus because people came to special to see and they can't get in, and it was a nightmare. But we started anyway, and I had to sort of fill time um, before, because my equipment wasn't hooked up yet by the AV people. So it, it just happened to be January 27 in the States, January 26, no, the other way around, January 26 here, and January 25 there. Uh, and I said, anyone know what day it is today in Australia? And they said, oh, it's Wednesday. And I said, well, actually, it's Tuesday, but it's a special day. And someone calls out, oh, it's Australian Day. And I said, well done. I always carry with me in America uh, little kangaroos and little um, um, sheep on, on, on the kiwis. I throw them out in the mirror and just go, oh, wow, it's so terrific. So I said, now, we, we are we Australians, not just are we down under there, not just to be driving the opposite side, but we celebrate the day we were invaded by the British. You celebrate the day you got rid of them. And so that got a little bit of a laugh from the historians of the audience. So I said, yeah, we're very different. By that time, we filled out the time and I was ready to go. But what I always like to do is put music into my slides to do the test, the sound test. So that's always running in the background, this music. Because the last thing I do is get them to have to rush over in the middle of your presentation because the music's too loud. So I've always started with music on one of my slides. But then I started by saying, I was so excited because last week, remember this is January 25, and the education seminar where iBooks author was released, iBooks 2 and iBooks author, was the week before, January 19. So I said I was so excited because at the education event at Hookenheim, we learned from this guy, Roger Rosner, who was the former head of the iWork team, that Keynote was still alive because it's been three years since Keynote's been updated, and we're all thinking it's been orphaned, or worse. And so he gave a presentation, and this is him giving his presentation on how to use iBooks author. And what was really interesting is how he focused on the use of Keynote, which is here. And so I said, does anyone know what I just did? What's it called? And so my presentation with this particular group is a combination of change the group and then stopping asking questions for which there's a prize. That's called keeping your audience engaged. As best you can. But it also shows what you can do with Kia, so you can talk and walk at the same time. So you can leave lots of, lots of marks along the way. So there's Kia there. But what's interesting is, is I said, you can, there are several ways that you can actually highlight something on Kia. You can put a circle around it. And as you can see, I've lifted it up and you get to highlight something. But there's a new piece of software called Zoomit. I'm trying to remember how to do this. <coughs> control Z. If I move my mouse and over here, it's Control Z. $10 piece of software called Zoomit, which allows you to put a marquee around something and call it out bigger. Now that's a very lousy illustration. But you can do it as a square, you can do it as a magnifying glass, you can control how deep you go in, you can control the size of the area. It's called Zoomit, it's a $10 app, and it's terrific for this sort of thing. But you need a focus, and that's what I'm here. What's that? You need to have it in focus. Yeah, that, that's an, that's just a screenshot. But if you've really got a very high quality picture, you can zoom right in on something using the zoom. Very handy little thing to do. Now, it's already, something like this is already built in if you use the assistance features in uh, assistant preps. But the trouble with that is the whole thing moves. That's very hard to control the quality and the size and the definition of the zoom. 
Whereas this one, you can locate just over an area. So go to the App Store, it's called Zuma. I'm going to try and get you some codes, so they're going to give you some codes for you. So if you really need it, go to the App Store, it's 10 bucks. Very handy little thing to have, called Zuma. Uh, all right. So this gave me hope that Keynote was alive, because it was now part of the iBooks author workflow. And I was ha a happy person. Okay? And um, here's another way to get in close. Not just with Zoom, how did I do this? Let me just say I pressed the button. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the effect of Keynote? Remember, the audience that I'm dealing with could come to see me know about Keynote. So anyone know what I did to what I did in Keynote to do that moving in? It's like a Ken Burns effect. Like Ken Burns it's it's a magic move. So it's a magic move. Yeah. So you simply create slide one, duplicate it becomes slide two, then you simply expand the graphic on slide two to what you want it to be, and then make the transition magic move and it will automatically move and size as you want it to be. And you kind of get a quasi Ken Burns effect. Is that kind of cool? Nobody yeah. knows how you did it. Now you know how I did it. And nobody knows how you did it. Well, like, well you, you did this with PowerPoint. Yeah, clueless. Yeah. Yeah. So I said to them, I was, I was very happy. I showed some of you this slide from last year, and I was very, very happy. And I showed this book, which is, contains the secret to happiness inside this book. Would you like to see what the secret to happiness is? You go in, you get this book, you give it a bit of a shake, and out pops the secret to happiness. The secret to happiness is <laughs> low expectations. <laughs> so I start just about every one of my workshops this way. No matter what's the subject is. I did one last week on presentation skills for health scientists at the University of Melbourne. I started this way. This is my, I think my second slide in. And we had experts in PowerPoint sitting there. And because the Mac is covered in black, you can't tell what machine I've got. Yeah? They all think it's a Dell, because they all think they're going to be lecturing in PowerPoint. And so I do this effect, my second slide in having been introduced. And this is what I do. And I'm watching these people. And half of them going, yeah, the other half of them going, because they know you can't do this in PowerPoint. Not just can't you do it in PowerPoint, you wouldn't even think to do it in PowerPoint. And that's my point. Because PowerPoint shapes up how your presentation is going to look because of its design faults. You are limited by its design faults, by its parameters, which is basically header, subheader, and five bullet points. And that's why survey slides look the way they do. Whereas when Peanut came out, of course it was made in Jobs image, so to speak. He said I want I want cinematic quality. Because he was very involved in Pixar at the time, 2003. And he wanted cinematic quality in his presentation. It's very graphic and intense. And so the, the cognitive style of Peanut is to do this sort of thing. Whereas the cognitive style of PowerPoint, I'll show you in a minute, not that you need to remind you. I actually changed this over uh, to a different version. So now we have the open book. Now, this actually was a flat PDF picture, flat picture, bless you, in Amazon.com. So I actually have the book. But to get that graphic, I actually took a, a screenshot of the book cover in 2D and created this 3D book. Not just the 3D book, I want you to someone repeat what I just did, but we're going to do it with a slight variation, because I want you to watch where the video comes out of. Watch where it comes from. Do you see? <laughs> the secret to happiness is low expectations. <laughs> Did you see? I'll show it to you one more time, because it's easy to miss. But I want you to see it comes from inside the book. Watch. The secret to happiness is low expectations. Showed the, the, the previous version with the, with the hardcover book and not with the, the video coming from inside. And it was at that point where the Apple engineer who created the animation effects, the movement, was sitting just where, where you are and scratching his head wondering how I did that. It didn't take a long to figure out what I've done. But the PowerPoint guys in this studio, in this workshop last week, just couldn't work out how, how I did it. So, how did I do that? How did it come from inside the book? 
Now, you have to think of what this workshop is called. It's called Presentation Magic. And magic is all about deception. And taking advantage of the fact that you've got brains which can be deceived. And it comes with bias and expectations. That's how magic works. It takes advantage of your bias and expectations. So how is that done? The movement is easy. This emotion effect. That was a multi-layer. Multi-layer. Very good. So, let me let you see up the sleeve of the magician what this picture actually is composed of. So we actually have two pictures. We have the strip on the side there, and then we have the movie sitting behind it. And in fact, what you didn't see on the second shot. See the little red dot yeah. down here? Did you see that the first time? No. Because you weren't looking for it. But I, I found this after I'd done this. I took a screenshot and I forgot that it had that. That, that little red dot says that there's emotion behind it, which is emotion of the, of the, of the um, quick time movie. So let me go back. See, it's not there. When I do it, now it appears. The secret to happiness is Low expectations. If you've not seen that, that little red dot is called change blindness. You might think, oh, what a bit of fun that is. But it's not fun if you're a pilot and you forget to see or you don't know. It's a little enunciator like that says it's a fire in the hole. So change blindness, our capacity to overlook something because our focus is here, is extremely important for a surgeon. You do not have a scalpel left inside you or a swab because you miscount it. So these little fun things are actually very important in the way human beings fail at tasks. This is called change blindness. None of you saw the red dot, but you did. You just didn't notice it. Yeah? So that's called change blindness. And now you see, if I go, you can see exactly. That's again a magic move. So what you thought was just one picture was in fact four pictures. The movie, two colours, and that strip to make you believe that the move, that the Open, was open and the movie came from within. Okay? And, and the trick here is the timing of the movie, the front cover, which you don't get to see. But it disappeared. So the movie can come out. Alright. So I hope you had fun with that. So then we start to talk about the principles of happiness. And one of the things I'm big on is not putting lots of words on slides but using graphics. There's a reason for that. And um, again, when I showed this last week, as well as at that world. Uh, this next effect, which is called a flop transition, gives you the feeling that you've just watched a book open. If you think about what made the Mac so popular compared to DOS, it was this. The ability for us to work with a computer, which was just ones and zeros, or before that, fluorescent greens, you know, ones and zeros, and make believe that we're working with an actual desktop. So the metaphor that the Mac used, that was different from DOS, was there was a rubbish bin, a trash, and there was a flat area that we put our files on, there was a filing cabinet which was our hard drive. So we've been using this metaphor of a 3D kind of bookshelf system since 1984 when that came out, not before that. So what you're seeing here, which looks like the Time magazine opened up, is in fact PDF of page one, PDF of page two. What is that middle strip that's there to give you a sense of depth. It's just a, a rectangular shape, and in Keynote, you can go in and put a gradient fill and make it appear as if you've got some depth in there. Now that takes a little bit of time to do. That slide probably took me 15, 20 minutes to do. And it's only going to be up there in a real presentation for like 20 minutes. And lots of people say, well, I haven't got time to do that. I've got to just rush in, rush in, rush in to do a presentation. Uh, but my feeling is this, that if you're going to do a presentation, you, you respect the audience by putting the effort in, not by just dumping text on a slide. That's not respecting your audience. So you do a little bit of extra work, even if it's only going to be up there for three minutes. You rehearse and you rehearse and you rehearse. Um, and that's how it works. The, the turning and the red is a Yes. Yes. So I did this use... a long time before the yeah, IP came. Yeah, but people are used to seeing that. Yes, that's right. So the metaphor continues, they just know what to do. Okay. So here's one page, here's another way of showing that. You can use magic move and do that and say there's a full page article in Time Magazine. Rather than saying Time Magazine 2005 up on a, on a slide, 
has shown in Time magazine. So I, I let you see that, I, that this thing actually exists. This is what it is. I didn't, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not simply writing Time magazine 2005, which is what, sci what scientists do. I went to the actual exhibit. And I showed, here's the four pages. And in fact, we can take out one of the diagrams and do that. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? But we can improve on this. Let's put it back together again and improve upon it. Make it just a fraction bigger, but I've added something that's subtle, but very vital to making this alive a bit more, a bit more engaging, a bit more effective. You see what I've done? I'll help you out a little bit. What have I done? Drop shadows. So if we go, if we have another look at this next one, look how effective all over the map is drop shadows. This was a being a model for jobs, just to make a flat two-dimensional surface more real so you feel it want to reach out to it, touch it, feel it, uh, and have an emotional relationship with what you're doing. That's one of the reasons why we're so enamored about Max. We have an emotional relationship with it. It's not just something to do work with. So you see the difference? I showed this again to this PowerPointing audience, not the one from Mac World, but the one last week at the University of Melbourne. And I sat there trying to evaluate, is this really important? Is this really what I want to do? You could just hear the clock, you know, the clocks ticking over. Uh, because it was such a different style than what they used to. And I want to talk about what's happening in social media. So I'm going to jump a few slides. I want to show you an effect that I've done with um, a number of groups. Very different background than the usual keynote or PowerPoint background, one of the third party ones I like to use. And I talk about social media, so let's jump a little bit ahead. And I usually ask people, what is this? If I talk to psychologists, people in my profession, and I ask them what do these mean, no one knows. Maybe they'll know Facebook. Most don't know Twitter. And I say, what about this? Well, I have to give them some head start, otherwise I'm never going to be very disappointed with themselves. The App Store, YouTube, and most people don't get this one, this next one, but you will because we talked about it before. This is false script. Remember we talked about false script? And I say, most people are now starting to move towards there being one device where they can connect to the world. And that one device looks like this. Well, I've put it there. It's a nice dramatic effect. Again, how is that done? Again, magic mm -hmm. It's very powerful. I'll go back a second. We'll do it again. By the way, if you just want to go back one step, if you hit the um, the square, um, not the bracket, but the square bracket, you can go back one step at a time, not through the whole slide. It's a little, little bit up. So let me just go back and build it once more for you. This is just simply a scale build to build it in, just to drop it in there. Okay? And a little bit of shadow around some of it, but watch again. Magic group form. Very effective, and it's the real thing. And by the way, that picture came from about two years ago from Apple's web page. All the white that would have been around it has been eliminated using the mask. You know, the mask can keep the pages. So, and then a bit of shadow around the outside there because it wasn't perfect. So, to make up for my little error, a little bit of shadow that makes up, and again, it lifts it off the background a little bit. These are subtle, not beating your face up, it's subtle but it's effective over an hour workshop. Okay. And one of the things I want to talk about is what I call the five A's of presenting. The five A's of presenting, here they are. How was that done? Magic move. It actually wasn't. Oh. <laughs> now, I actually moved each of these individually. This is one slide, and each of them moved individually using motion scale build. Five builds on the one slide. Okay. There's a reason for that. So, let me take you through the five A's. One, I've already mentioned it. Think about your audience. The brain, how the brains work. That's my area there. For most of the uh, presentation, people will talk about design and art and color and fonts. I talk about how the brain works, so that's my forte. Uh, the, other, the only other group I'm in common with are magicians who also understand how the brain works, but without not, uh, an understanding of neuroscience. They're just 3,000 years of being of handing down folklore of how magic works without knowing exactly what's going on inside the brain. Magic is one of the oldest performing arts that we've seen in the storytelling. Know how your audience works. Two, notice attention. How to keep attention. How to keep your audience engaged. What's the attention systems work? Three, how to establish authority. 
you introduced Evan Taps, ra ra ra. What I said to people is that we've got authority given to you, it's yours to lose. And you lose it. Once you are, you start, it's there to lose. It's game. It's already been introduced. It's one person in an audience of 2,000, it's yours to lose. So you've got to work hard to keep your authority. So how I construct my slides, and how I tell stories, and how I don't have to keep on going, oh, which button do I use? I control things is as to my authority, as well as the sources of information that I use. And that's part of the authenticity. And when I say, Time Magazine did a really interesting bit of research, I actually show you the research. So I don't just say it, I show it. That's the authenticity factor. Then the final one is the one where I usually get the audience to hold up their iPhones, which are switched off. That's called the forwards, which is an engineer. Any engineers present? Engineers? Engineers? Affordance? In engineering terms? Never. Okay. I thought it would be applause, actually. No, it's affordance. If you, if you um, give someone who doesn't know how to use an iPhone an iPhone, and you just hit the home button and it just comes to the front, what, what do you see? What's the first thing that you see to, to unlock it? Which? The slider. And what's the slider doing? If you just look at the slider, what's the slider doing? Yes, the slide is going like this. Yeah, when you, when you first go like this, that's an affordance. It tells you to do this. You don't have to read anything, it just tells you to switch it off. Up the top, different location, in red, same thing. Switch it go. It's an affordance, it tells you what to do. All Apple products are filled with affordances, that's why we like them, that's why we don't have to read a manual. What's that? That's what they pay for. That's right. That's right. Oh, these are afford and Apple products are full of affordances. Things that, which is a user interface term, that's how you know how to use it without having to read the manual. Just know what's coming next. Do you feel that with, if you, you've moved from Windows to App to Mac? This, do you understand what I'm saying here? Yeah. You just know what to do without having to say, well, what's supposed to happen next? And Windows is filled with instructions which confuse people. You've committed an illegal instruction. My partner works with elderly people, 50s, 60s, 70s, sorry, 70s, 80s, 90s. <laughs> <laughs> now the women are 50s have to change, another 20 years. Who are coming to the Mac or coming to Windows, that come from Windows, and she has to work with them sometimes, and the, the, they get hand-me-down Windows machines from their children of 30, 40. And they get these virus written old Windows machines, which is the worst machine to give such a, a crowd. And out comes the instructions, you've committed an illegal instruction. And she says, my partner says, them, when did this happen? And they say, three days ago. They say, well, why don't you switch it on? I switch it off, reboot it. So I was afraid, so I was going for the police to tell me, but you know what to do. But think about how the engineers talk that you committed an illegal instruction. This is great if you're a coder, but terrible for a 75 year old. Makes no sense. So Apple, remember, we had a system bomb. System yeah. six and seven. System one. First time I got my Mac Plus, I said to all my looking at it, not knowing what to do. This is 1989. So these are important. There's something subtle happening on this on this screen again. Quite subtle. You wouldn't even notice it until I pointed it out. But can you see it? What is it? The shadows. Tell me about the shadows. Yes. So because this is a grey screen, a grey faded screen. The ones at the top have got a whitish shadow, and the ones on the bottom have got a blackish shadow. So they've all got a little bit to lift them off. But it's subtle. So you don't have to think that it's there, but it's there and it's effective. Okay? Now, next. This is where we get a little bit tricky because this is where this particular slide stack finished, and I had several issues. So in the Mac, you, in the keynote list, you have this. Notice how on the slide, the pointer, the mouse pointer has turned to a finger. It's not a mouse pointer anymore, it's a finger. Why? What's going on here? It's a hyperlink. Tell me about hyperlinks. So the model is when you go browsing and the word is underlined. But you know, the thing that made the, the, the web the web was the hyperlink. Elsewhere. Well, the same thing can happen on the Mac in Keynote. You can go 
within the one slide to another slide, or from one slide stack to another slide stack, which are audio and stuff, they can just leap invisibly, rather than have to say, oh, excuse me, I find the next, my next PowerPoint stack and pop out, show all those slides and pop back in. You don't want to do that. That's terrible. Okay? So this is a hyperlink, and we know because this entire slide is a hyperlink, and it's going to take us to the next one. And the hope is that if it's open, you get to the next one. Just a little fact. We've actually now skipped the next slide stack. And what I want to say is, why do we need to think differently about slides, about presentations? Well, I gave a presentation at this um, event in Washington, D.C. last year. Let me show you some of these slides that I can see through that helps confirm that the work I'm doing is important to this world. <laughs> So you've got, you know, you've got things that say barn doors, and you've got spiral, and spinning, and there's one right down the bottom that says random. <laughs> <laughs> that to me just epitomizes the thinking that Microsoft puts into this random. As if we don't give a shit about the transitions. But it's so important to think, you know, what made movies movies was editing and transitions. If you go back to the early 1900s, what made movies movies, because all movies were made linearly where people could edit and go from here to there out of time sequence using edits and transitions, that's what made movies movies. And it's this 100-year history of transitions. And to put it on just random is to ignore 100 years of this history of, of movie making, which is really our dominant form of information transfer, which is not in the today's world, it's movies. So this is what I have to put up there. Of course, the audience is first themselves. Still laughing because I didn't need to explain anymore. The work that I'm doing is there, in your face. Next. <laughs> Which means another transition. So you can understand the, the principle of hyperlinks, yeah? Um, Les, could you set up those pages to have different links in different areas so you could go? No. no? The next one, this is the entire page. So do you want to know how I did that? Explain. You can make areas on that page links. So the top right hand corner, take me to slide stack three. Top left hand corner, one. That's, that's corner, what I was, four. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to know that. It's like a magician. Mm -hmm. Magicians will say, pick a car. And on their body are three different types of cars. The three of clubs, the seven of diamonds, one's here, one's there, <laughs> one's here. And whichever one you choose, they have to know where the store is. That's how it works. So, they're not, so you get some choice, which means, oh, there's huge choice, but there's only three choices of three. But you have to know where you store it. That's how a lot of mentalism works. Uh, where, was this, where did you find this in the book? Over there. Oh, but there's about half a dozen different placements of different objects all around the room. That's how magic works, but you have to remember where it is. And it's the same with this. Let me show you. I was going to show you this. I'll, I'll come back to it. I just created this for them to share with people. And um, there's a bit of fun with um, um, this is a bit of fun with high. <laughs> And the idea is, correct answer, 
and go and get a prize. Incorrect answer? Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to show you what the correct answers are. So let's drop out of this for a second. I'm going to show you all of the correct answers. Because uh, I took a shot of it. Here. So here are all the correct answers. I need someone to be responsible for one of the correct answers. So who wants to be whiteboard killer? Whiteboard killer. Record and replay class lessons. Greater credit control. Take a blank slate and run with it. Right. It's incredibly intuitive. Can you help me please? I can't see. Incredibly intuitive. So these are all the answers. Yeah? These are all the answers. I have to know where they are, by the way. And I have to remember where they are still. So let's go back into it. And I'll show you what you can do. This is great for kids. Kids love this. I'll try and get my mouse back over to Keynote. And we'll go back into the series. I'm in this area, see what the mouse pointer is? It's a mouse pointer. But if I go over any of these, it's a link. So let's just say, why do teachers love the series? Someone give me a bullshit answer. It's cheap. Yeah. Which I know is not correct. It's not correct. If I click here, in the outside, <coughs> up comes the wrong response. Um, it's made in America. <coughs> Wrong answer. If I click anywhere outside here, a sound will, sh will, will play. Someone who got the right answer, give me the right answer. And remember where they, what number you were. Uh -huh. Where were you, Brian? Four. You were four. So Brian says... Brian says... What's call that again? Yeah. Oh. Is take a back slate and run with it up there on the board? It is? Yes. So, that, that's, that's nice. But that's not a big deal. Let's get somebody else. What number was it? Do you remember? Number two? Is number two, what was it again? You can record it. Is it up there on the board? Yes, it is! Do you see what's happening here? You can play this one look at a family feud. Or you can give out a jeopardy. So it doesn't matter what order you get the answers. You have to know as a magician, otherwise you'll give it away. If someone again gives you now the wrong answer, you go out here, and you can... <laughs> The beauty of this is, you can put all this on your iPad, have the Desiree here on the iPad, and do it from here, rather than being at the Mac. Is that cool? Can you see teachers doing this a lot? Playing with kids, playing Jeopardy. Okay, number one answer. Number third, three, third answer. This is what happens if you get, oh, who got number five? Who was five? What was five? <laughs> see, this is the problem with being a magician. You have to choose the right audience for this It's intuitive. It's intuitive, very good. It hates memory. Yes? <laughs> so you can have a lot of fun with this. The question becomes, how was it done? I would just think that would work well with the interactive whiteboards that they use in classes. Yes, yes there's a lot of things you can do. Recall. So what we're trying to do is think well and truly outside of that text written box. So let me show you do what the magicians are not meant to do and, uh, and show you what this actually, <coughs> what this stack looks like. You have 34 individual slides. And there's a starting line with the movie. Here are all the different sounds <coughs> sitting outside, plus a correct sound. Each of these has a hyperlink to it. And then you have the individual ones, if you just so happen to get one, two, three, four, five in a row. But if you're outside of that, you've already got the 
two, you keep on going down. Can you see what's going on? You have to account for every possibility and then link to it, no matter where you are. And that's why it takes hours to set this up for that five minute effect. But that's what I mean about authenticity. You know, it's the real deal here. It's a bit like hypercar. It's, it's very much like hypercar. Very much like, for those of you who've got memory of hypercar. Mm -hmm. But let's go down a little bit further. We can see, look, you have to account for every possible permutation and create links. And the way you do it is easy, actually. It's also hard. Yeah, this is where you start to use your master list up here. So you have to understand how masters work. So this is how it works. I sent it to the Siri guys to, to use in there uh, when they go overseas and they do their trade shows and that sort of thing. How much fun is this? So, um, so that's <coughs> Siri family cute. Kind of cool stuff. What's the time? Okay, let me take you through a couple of things. Okay, have you got hang around a bit more? Yeah. All right. So let me take you through one of the things I want to show what I did. I was uh, in September, I think I mentioned to you before, I was in Seattle giving a presentation on the of flying in here to a group of aviation specialists. And they were there for a conference called Apex, uh, which is an expo about in-flight entertainment. So lots of people selling iPads and content, uh, airline seats and all sorts of things. The people who were on before me, I was on a four o'clock bill on before me, were senior managers of Airbus and Boeing doing very typical PowerPoint, as you might imagine, in engineering terms. Very, very powerful. And then I come along with this, I'm going to show you now. Uh, they made me use this template, which is the background. That's what you've got to do sometimes if you sign up. That's the deal. You've got to use any backgrounds on your own. And you're supposed to use it through the entire workshop, the entire 30-minute presentation. I use it for the first slide in the story. Thank you very much. <laughs> and what I needed to do is work with this group who were there to be entertained. And yet here I am talking about fear of flying. And fear of flying in commercial aviation is an undiscussable. We don't want to talk about fear of flying. We want it to be fun and enjoy. We don't want to even acknowledge that people fear of flying. And if I'm going to try and sell them this idea of fear of flying, I've got to find a way to get into that, to sell it and say, it's really important that you understand fear of flying. Take a guess, why would it be important that they know about fear of flying? What, what's why is it not value? What's the, what's the big deal about it? What is it? Might be. It could be a safety issue. It's a, a few more customers. So is it, would it not be reasonable that the best way to get to these people to say, what I'm here for is worthwhile, is the bottom line. The bottom line. So what I want to say is that you have to find, for this girl, I have to find a funny way to start. A bit of humour. So I said they've been in the world of aviation, there have been two times when having a fear of flying was actually normal. You wouldn't actually consider seeing a psychologist for fear of flying. The first time was at the very beginning of aviation. When they, when they said to you, would you like to sit on the wing? They really meant it. <laughs> <laughs> now at this point they laughed, but some of them weren't sure they're supposed to laugh. <laughs> so at the end of the day, am I supposed to laugh or not? Because it's all been very heavy duty powerful. You know, I'm supposed to laugh. I said, because back then, it truly was dangerous to fly. So it's quite normal to have a fear of flying. You would never consider going to a psychologist because you would never think it was abnormal. I didn't need treatment. Of course, it's, I should be afraid. But then I said, by the way, um, I tried to find an original wing walking picture circa 1917, 18, but I couldn't find one. So this is, in fact, a, a rather modern picture. Uh, and wing walking has come back to fashion in aviation, air shows now. Do you notice what I did then? A very slow color to emphasize within the here and now to make that transition. Try and do that slow dissolve in PowerPoint and people will laugh because it just goes a little bit and pixelates. You can't do it. But do that in the Mac. I've done this in 30 seconds. Remember Peter, the um, photographer, Peter Walton? <laughs> First time he played with Keynote, the new PowerPoint came to me and said, let's help me out with my Keynote. And he created these you know, beautiful pictures of the outback. And he then applied these Photoshop filters to make them look like oil paintings. And he was going down to a photography club in Frankster. And he wanted to show how he went from his original photograph to these Photoshop oil paintings. And so what we did is we took the original photo and then we took his Frankston Photoshop ones and we did a 30 second dissolve. Now, you know how the retina displays, it's meant to be slower than you can actually, it's meant to be 
smaller than you can actually make, well, this was slower than you can make, you can actually see the transition. So it was this really slow 30 second transition from a, from a picture to an oil painting. So you couldn't see where, where one began the other. But you saw when it ended. And we did this for about six photos and just knocked them silly. You just can't do that in painting. But just go this. But it's a beautiful dissolve. Notice what I've also done in the, um, the outline that I've put around it to bring it out and the corners that you can do in cleaner to make it look like it's a picture. By the way, that effect, remember the original picture is, is the one that's, that's that one. That's the original picture. So there's a, um, a lovely piece of software that's about $16 called FX Studio Pro or something, and it applies that filter to it, which is kind of nifty. Now, at the time, the first flight attendants were in fact nurses. The first flight attendants were nurses because if you got sick flying and you threw up all the time because you're flying at 8,000 feet in turbulence. So, you, so this woman here, Ellen Church, was so the this first flight attendant. Right. The first flight attendants were called were the aircraft engineers. And because they were picking up the plane on the ground, yeah. they had time to serve the drinks. <laughs> well, Ellen Church is actually credited with being the first flight attendant. She was actually a trained pilot, went to Boeing, which at the time in San Francisco was an airline, as well as a manufacturer, and went to the head, the Boeing head, head office in San Francisco, and says, I want to be a pilot. He said, you're a woman, you can't be. And she was so desperate to be on board a plane, she said, look, I'm also a trained nurse, just put me on board the aircraft, I just want to be a part of aviation. And he said, okay, you can mop up everything, because people are throwing up. Time, which is I'm a trained nurse, so the first nurses were actually there to help people overcome their fear of flying. So fear of flying goes over aviation for 100 years. My point was a pedantic one. Yes, thank you. They <laughs> <laughs> one in an audience. <laughs> <laughs> notice what I've done here. These are two slides. Please notice what I've done to, hunt, to call her out. Favoured the, the group in the background, brought her in and put a glow around her. All the glow is, is one picture of her, a second picture. So there's now three pictures of her. The one in the original picture, an overlay of her, and a second overlay. The first one gets a shadow to the left, the second one gets the shadow to the right. So that's how you get the glow all the way around her. Otherwise, if it's just a shadow, you just put one side or the other. Make sense? So when you think there's only one thing there, there's actually three pictures on that slide. And they all sit on top of each other. And then I want to say, there's a new series. Of Roads. 
and compare it to the year before the year before. And this is what they found. After controlling for time trends, weather, road, other factors, we find that travelers' res response to 9 11, 9 11 resulted in 340 people driving deaths per month in late 2001. Effective 9 11 wind over time, but a total of about 2,170 driving deaths may be attributed to the attacks. In other words, instead of flying, people drove. You see where we're going? And compared to years when they were flying, we had an extra 2,000 people dying on roads because they didn't fly. Okay? Because they were too scared to fly, or their businesses said, no, you can't fly, it's too dangerous. And it represented an extra 2,000 people who would have ordinarily been alive had they flown, not drove. So this is where I'm starting to get to say, it's serious business here we're talking about. There's lives at stake, there's money at stake. Notice what I've done here to get authenticity. The original article, and then I've brought out the important part. <coughs> Up and I took out the original part. And in fact, can you see where it says investment another level of retail time? I tried to about, and it's all blank. Because I didn't want, I wanted that to be bigger. Boom. That's the money shot. So I actually put a white shape over where it is about and covered it over. It's there, but I covered it over and took a screenshot and brought it out. Because I wanted that to be a big deal. Watch again in this next piece of research. In the early 1980s, um, Boeing commissioned some research. Dina Whitaker worked for Boeing, and this is the first big study of fear of flying. Here's the money shot. One in every six adults, 25 million people in 1980 is afraid to fly. Now we're starting to talk money. Magic move to focus in and a call out to draw attention to where I want your eye to go. That's the magic part. I'm directing your eye where to go. You can't help it. Just want to look there. Okay. Too many words on this slide, but we know it's the original article, so we take the part I want and bring it out. Okay. Society air travel, there are two core questions. Is flying a real problem? Fear of flying a real problem? And what should be done about it? Turn the page. Boom. Take the head and make it big. We know exactly where it's come, where it's come from. And now we do this. Fear of flying is estimated to have cost the domestic industry 21 million trips, 6 million business trips, 15 million personal trips. If it's a one way fare of 75, that 21 million trips means that each year in 1980, around 1980, how much money did the American travel industry lose? $1.6 billion in 1980. Now, that $1.6 billion was at the end of loss of. But I didn't want, it was going to be hidden there. I wanted an impact. So we have seen so often the, the anvil you know, dropping in apple peanuts in the air, aviation world, never seen it before in their lives. So for them it's big time. Boom! And I made it big. So I needed to hit them over the head that this is costing your industry money. Now we're about 10 minutes into my presentation and now I've got them interested. But it took me about 10 minutes having a bit of a laugh, a bit of a joke, a bit of, this is a bit different. More the money time. What do you think about the estimated impact now? Yes. Is that actually bringing it out of the document in the keynote? Or it's an overlay. A clip and it's an overlay. Yeah. It's a screenshot yeah. that then boom, comes out. Yeah. So it sits over it. Yeah, so you could do it in a sketch or something like yes. that. Yes. But you just do a screenshot. Some other bits on the top of just do a screenshot. Yeah. I talked about there being three international conferences on fear of flying. The first one took place here in New York. The second one, they had to travel in 1996, the second one, we actually traveled from uh, the North American continent, and we traveled over to Vienna. How did I do that? How did I do that? What is it? <laughs> what? Did you fly? I flew, yes, I flew. I actually didn't get to Vienna. But how did I do this? Okay, I'm going to do it again. Because so from Vienna in 2000, we actually went back uh, to the northern uh, North of the continent to Montreal. So how was this done? It wasn't done in keynote. iMovie. So iMovie has a maps thing. So I simply created that and exported it to QuickTime Movie Book. Built it into keynote. Very effective, isn't it? Just a change of pace. I could have said Tarrytown, Vienna, Montreal. How boring is that? So keep the interest going. 
Uh, so we entered Montreal in 2007, it was sponsored by the United Nations, the ICAO, and out of there came this book. This again is one of those flat two-dimensional pictures. I created a third-dimensional picture of a book. It uses a, um, uh, a spear, piece of software called BoxShot 3D to create this book. You can create CD covers and all sorts of things. One trick pony, 79 bucks, brilliant. And then I said, there are three effects. So I'm going to skip around a little bit. And I said, on board any one people the plane, about a third of people love being there. You get the delays and the TSA, they just love flying. A third of people, I can live with it. I can deal with it, I don't mind. But a third of the people, I really would rather get there some, some other way. A third, a third, a third. That's about the, what you're dealing with. I'm going to my plane. And then I went through the reasons. One, for the turbulence. Two, scary incidents such as a poor landing or takeoff. Or maybe there's uh, unusual sounds that I can't work out, or vibrations, all different things. Or motion illusions. I think I'm falling in the back of the plane still climbing. Uh, there might be internal reasons, like I've got a pre existing panic disorder, or um, I have a fear of heights, or, or claustrophobia, or separation anxiety, I don't like leaving home. And then I want to demonstrate uh, something else, like loss of control. And so I went to a Boeing movie. Now it's going to skip a little bit because it's in flash and I didn't do a great job on this, but it does the job. This is inside that particular Boeing 747. Remember the audience I'm dealing with? They're aviation specialists, yeah? And they may or may not have seen this. And uh, see the curtains down there? It's actually a bar. But we're going to have a bit of a play with this because what I want to say is that what can often happen is that you can project feelings onto the plane depending on where you're going, where you're coming from. So this actually, the plane actually acts like a screen. And onto the screen, we can project all sorts of fears and apprehensions about our lives, such as <coughs> maybe we're heading off to a wedding. Fun time, great times, but it may also create apprehensions for us. Notice something here. I've kept the foreground. Can you see I've kept the foreground in there? That required some cutout stuff. Okay, that wasn't easy to do, but we did it. Maybe we're going to or from a very difficult personal group situation. We project onto the plane our feelings of unhappiness. Or maybe with its performance anxiety, I'm going to a place where I might fail big time. Or I'm going to an interview where my career is on the line. And of course, the last excuse for not flying is we take away from us expense, cheap airlines. Yeah. <laughs> what I can to say is that um, it took me about a minute to find a dozen different cheap budget airlines. Here they all are. Now that mosaic transition, the PowerPoint girls are sitting there going, what? <laughs> that took me a little while to get the perspective properly because each of the, if I go back a section, watch how each of the squares matches the mosaic. Watch this. Can you see? That took like an hour to do for that little effect. Why? Because I, I had to draw yellow lines on the, on the, uh, the shape of Ford across this way to try it because the squares are not the same size. When Apple did the mosaic, they actually have different sizes and you lose the effect. So I have to draw yellow lines to try and find exactly the right shape or the right size and match. Okay? And what I want to say is that here's the, um, the last excuse is gone. Now everyone can fly. Boom. Now everyone, and I made a motion out of it. What actually happens here is I took a screenshot of that and put it on the airline behind it and then move it back up there. Do it again. See the difference? Boom. Mm -hmm. And I, what I try and do is time what I'm saying to what you're seeing. Okay? I'll finish off with this one. So some airlines have actually acknowledged fear of flying. This is a uh, North African airline. Here's where everyone sits. So they're actually naming the various air, air parts. Uh, air part parts. Now, if we go to the rear of the aircraft, we can see again that part. The part I really like is this one, which says Lou, mm -hmm. the mild high five initiation chamber. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what's interesting about this, if I go back, is that I created the cube. That's because there are two different pictures of these planes here, and I couldn't get them to match up. But by aligning them with the cube, it looks as if it's the one plane, but it's not. It's not the one plane at all. I want you to have a look. 
here. Not not the easy view at the back there, but there's a can you see a slight line there? Can you see that? That's because the picture is actually all the way up there on this particular aircraft. But to bring it down to align it with the next shot, I took a bit of a screenshot and just put it up there, hoping you wouldn't notice it. Because that's not where your eye goes, your eye goes here. That's the magic part, misdirection it's called. Now you see it, ah, but there's been more misdirection. See the hair? What happened to it? Oh. But you didn't notice it. Because that's not where you're looking, that's the misdirection part. There's lots of misdirection too because down the bottom here where the ground is, this section down here, that's also been coloured in and added. So that the corners match. So that what happens is you get this straight line from the top because that's where your eye goes. And you think it's the one plane, but it's not. That's misdirection. Okay? And then this is a magic move. And I couldn't help myself because at the end of the talk I said to them, you guys in the airline business have got a lot to learn. And there's no better person to learn from than Steve Jobs. <laughs> now, this was September 12th. The book was still to come. It was a month away still. And the book didn't exist like that. So again, I used that box shot 3D to take a picture from him <coughs> and create the 3D book. And I said, and it looks like it's a quote from him, but it's not it's my quote. At each step of the flying process, accommodate your customer. Surprise and delight them. And under promise and over the little is a motto for Apple. So I'm going to finish off now by taking you to something a really high risk maneuver. This is a very high risk maneuver. And I'll finish off with this. Um, if we go back to our planes. You can create a wall of motion and Whatever you do, don't do this in PowerPoint because you'll blow the CPU up. <laughs> Watch. You'll blow the CPU up. So be very careful when you do this next part. Let's see what happens. Let me get this thing to happen. Motion. 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 These are all 40 megabyte looping quick time movies. Don't ever try this in PowerPoint. Because it'll never work. The machine will just bog down. These are 12 40 meg movies, all working simultaneously, looping on. <laughs> oh, and this is one having PowerPoint. The machine just goes into play. So then we actually now have a 10th, I mean a 13th image, which is a uh, the flame build in, uh, in Keynote. So 13 images. Still go. That's my little PS4 resistor. Thanks, everyone.